you all of uh, John Global and, and our global, what pieces of advice, if there's two pieces of advice that you have to offer to other CEOs that are thinking about going global, what would those, what would those two things be? And, and maybe start with Trevor. Sure, well certainly um, you need to have the right finance, accounting, tax, uh, infrastructure, including treasury, which would touch on the currency question. And uh, with, without that, I don't think you feel comfortable taking on this complexity. And it's true that that is a, a cost of, of the business and it can be quite expensive, but uh, in, in another sense, it's a barrier to entry. So from, from our point of view, we've been doing it since 1998 and we've gradually built this up. Essentially, we are a local sharpshooter in our minds because we uh, were pioneers in the sale lease tax space in Europe uh, at a time when corporate uh, CFOs didn't want to didn't want to sell their real estate. So we've been there from the beginning and uh, and gradually built it up. Uh, I think that the other thing is absolutely it's true to do you need to do uh, work with the right partners anytime you go international in the net lease space. <coughs> excuse me, the right partner for us is our long term tenant. Uh, they're the seller of the asset, but then they remain in the, in the building for 15 to 20 years. And so uh, a lot of the value that is up front when you're uh, underwriting that credit. And so uh, they're your, your best protection, I think, against uh, problems globally. Ben, you, you were in the UK, you came out, you have the Australian business for sale, you're gonna be a domestic only business. Um, what two pieces of advice would you offer then to uh, someone else, uh, whether it be in the tower business or just in general real estate? <clears throat> about going global? I'm gonna give you a little bit of a paradoxical answer. Um, first is, I agree with others that have said this, it's uh, by definition, it's, a, it's an added complexity and significant management strategy to do it. And so if you're gonna do it, you need to sort of go bigger to home. It needs to be worth the effort and the distraction to make a material difference in your financial outcome if it goes well. So you, you underwrite things and hope it goes well, and if that actually occurs, you need to get paid for the effort. And um, I, I find many times, Management teams get focused on distractions that even if it goes well, doesn't come out with an outcome that actually moves the needle. And that's, that's certainly the case in a company our size. Um, secondarily, the, sort of the, the flip side of the coin is we're in the business of investing US dollar capital. And when you go cross border, by definition, you're taking currency risk. And uh, it troubles me to tell you that in our Australian investment, which we've been in since, since the year 2000, we have double on the currency for a while. Now we're only at 50%. But uh, it's certainly going to help our, our exit. And we're exiting 50% up, not 50% up. 50% up, right, okay, right. not a double, not 100%. <laughs> um, nonetheless, we've done extremely well in the country. It's a fantastic place. And we're exiting for, for reasons not related directly to the, to the business or the currency exposure. But I, uh, but I would say it troubles me a little bit that our, uh, our significant, you know, part of our significant IRR we generated down there has been you know, led by the currency, where if you're on the flip side of that, obviously in the last couple of years, in a capital intensive business where it's pretty efficient what you buy assets for, it's not just like it's a competitive market in the US, it's a very competitive market you know, all over the world, and, uh, and, and cap rates get bid pretty tightly, then uh, if you show up with the wrong currency, you're adding a risk that potentially uh, you, you can't properly price. Uh, it was mentioned on the earlier panel, I think there's 37 countries that have adopted the Reaper yep. today, and all the G7 countries, so in theory, I know it's not actually the case every day in every country, but in theory, capital should be able to be formed pretty efficiently in the country in the correct currency to efficiently capitalize real estate assets in those markets. Now that's certainly challenging in, in, uh, in emerging markets, but not so challenging in Western, in, in, in the EU countries, and there's some pretty efficient markets over there. And while you can hedge to a degree, you can certainly finance locally and finance the debt component, if you want to finance more than that, well, then you're inherently you know, taking some balance sheet capacity away from your U.S. business. Uh, you get into thin capital rules and lots of other complexities. But so I don't, I don't have a lot of help for you today, Michael. I'd say it's you got to go bigger, go home, to make it worth your while, and uh, and then you have to price the asset fully reflected by that incremental risk you're taking on rent currency. Hi. Yeah. First of all, I fully agree. Uh, that first of all, you need to identify business opportunity. If you go to all that trouble and uh, to the order and complexity, uh, you need to see light at the end of the uh, that tunnel. So that's absolutely a given. Uh, I think that the first advice would be to be very patient. It takes a long time. You need a couple of years, maybe three years, till you really understand everything you need to understand in order to invest in a uh, in a foreign country. Uh, and you have to be able to withstand uh, the GNA spillage. 
And the questions that our youth board members would ask you every quarter as to why are we doing it and uh, and, and analysts and investors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and frankly, uh, many investors uh, did it differently. They made a big investment. They lost a lot of money in the investment, but they did not spend any GNA. So, uh, in final analysis, I'd rather spend some GNA and avoid uh, these costly mistakes. Um, I also think that uh, whoever considers going into another country needs to know that you would need to have some boots on the ground. Uh, I don't believe in the JV model, the partners model. Uh, I always used to see, say that the best real estate is the one that is all by absentee landlords. You don't want to be one. Yeah. So you need to have boots on the ground. You have to have somebody who's your company down to speak your language or this who, who understands exactly, if you understand exactly what he tells you when he tells you that. And this guy who is on the ground, he needs to create uh, the team that will work for him, that team will be low because now when you mature, when your company matures like uh, first capital or equity one, then of course you, you have access to the pool of talent and you don't need to worry about it. But in the incubation stage, you need your own people on the ground to tell you what's going on. And you need to understand it, it takes time and money. The second thing I would advise would be, don't believe it when you hear, this is how we do business here. Yeah. Uh, because that's what you're going to hear and a lot. To me, the whole reason for going somewhere else, and I think the business opportunity is really what I call, depends how polite I want to be, uh, operational excellence or operational arbitrage. Okay. There, is, if there, are, there are places that have different cultures, and those, those cultures are not necessarily conducive to, to, to better returns on their assets being as politically correct as I can. And uh, I believe that this culture can change. Uh, and uh, it just takes time and uh, perseverance. And, and you can demonstrate it to, to uh, your audience and uh, the people in, the, in that country, how it gets done. It takes a lot of work. We do a lot of exchanges. People come to the US, to Canada, to learn to benchmark and so on. It takes a lot of time, right. but it's worth it because there is an operational arbitrage.